Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming out to tonight's event. Um, I am so honored and delighted that so many of you uh, have come tonight um, to listen to a topic that I think is really near and dear to my heart, and I'm excited that so many other people are interested in it. Um, I want to first sort of welcome you to NYU. This event has been put together through the Data and Society Research Institute in collaboration with the Information Law Institute here at NYU and in collaboration with uh, the White House um, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, this is part of a series of events. Uh, it's basically the second in a, in a series that have been put together in collaboration with the White House. The first was held at MIT two weeks ago, um, and where the focus of that conversation was really about technology and about privacy and what kind of technological development could actually help us address uh, these issues in productive ways. The third is going to be held at Berkeley in about two weeks, a few weeks, um, and it'll explore the legal and policy questions that emerge as we think about questions around big data. But this conference is really dedicated to the questions of the social, cultural, and ethical. How do we understand what's really unfolding, what are the issues at play um, that really affect people, and how do we actually get a way of talking about that? Um, in many ways, data is about to uh, transform a wide, a wide variety of different sectors, from healthcare to education, national security to marketing. The implications are, um, are not just contained to the public or private sector, and indeed, both will be affected alongside civil society and journalism. Furthermore, the implications will be intertwined, blurring the boundaries between sectors and domains. Um, vigorous debates are currently underway in certain domains, but there are many other social, cultural, ethical issues that we haven't even figured out how to get our minds around, how to frame the issues. And that's part of what drove our desire to put together this event. We need to start teasing these issues out, start talking across sectors, across domains, across communities to really try, try to make sense of it. In a society that's so focused on individual rights, how do we deal with data that is fundamentally networked? What kinds of data can exist to benefit um, research and the public good? And what are the consequences of having that data be widely available? Who should be serving as caretakers of data? How should those who possess um, the access to data think about their uses and how should they be held accountable? How do we address inequalities and questions of discrimination that are bound to occur when we start dealing with issues of data? How do we grapple with who's really holding the, you know, the ropes on this? Who's, what is visible? What is invisible? These are just sort of the questions that we've started to emerge and started to have a conversation about. Um, but they quickly raise all sorts of interesting challenges as we think about this. And it's one of the motivating you know, desires to have everybody here today um, to have these conversations. Um, I am in the process of starting a new Think and Do tank here in New York City, and this is called the Data and Society Research Institute. And the reason that I put together this institute is because I feel like these questions are going to keep plaguing us unless we start bringing together different constituencies to try to address them. And so I was really delighted when um, I was asked and invited to put together an event to try to grapple with these issues in front of all of you and in front of a larger public. Um, and that's precisely why we're here tonight, is to try to get people talking about this. Earlier today, we held a series of small intensive workshops with researchers and practitioners who are really trying to do this on the ground, different experts, um, different ex practitioners who can make sense of what are the challenges presented by big data. We'll be making all of those videos and documents available in the coming days, basically as soon as we can, uh, because we really want this material to be in the public domain, and we want to invite you to look at what we, we come up with and challenge us, to speak back to us. So I invite you to sort of come to the Data and Society website, and we will basically make all of this material available, and we'll invite you to talk back to us. This, the conversations we had today are the beginning of a very invigorating reminder that much work needs to be done to address these issues. We don't have the solutions, even the experts and the practitioners, they don't know the path forward. And so we need to actually involve larger and larger constituencies. Indeed, that's part of the reason for having this public event as part of this, is that we actually wanted a moment where people could speak back. Um, tonight's event is really meant to do that public work, and so we're going to have a couple of different components to it, and really we're going to conclude it with both an opportunity for you to ask questions, but more importantly, for you to provide insights that we think are really important so we can hear from you as we're dealing with these issues. Earlier today, we were thrilled to have the counselor to the president, John Podesta, with us. Unfortunately, he was called back to the White House for a meeting this afternoon. But he did leave us with a video, which we're going to present to you, um, which will be a preview of how they're thinking about these issues, and it'll be available on their website later this week. Um, we will also uh, have a great honor of having Nicole Wong from the Office of Science and Technology Policy here to keynote and give you a sense of how they're thinking about it and the kinds of conversations that are important to have. 
Um, she's really here to contextualize the administrative's, uh, administration's interest in the implications of big data. Um, the panel that we've put together tonight is actually meant to draw on people who come from different sectors and different domains and different approaches. Um, and we hope that that will be an exciting opportunity for you to, to engage with these issues. Um, more than anything, I think this is a really fun opportunity to bring together a variety of folks. As I saw, trying to hush all of you, that there's so much interest in this room, so many interesting conversations that are being had. So please do enjoy this. Um, before I begin, I'm sort of going to take my moment to, to switch um, videos to the video uh, that was given to us from John Podesta. Um, John Podesta is currently serving as the counselor to the president. His duties include overseeing climate change and energy policy. In January, he, uh, the president asked him to lead a comprehensive view, uh, review of big data and privacy. And it's within this capacity that he decided to put together this video. Would you mind showing the video, please? Hi, I'm John Podesta, counselor to President Obama and chair of the Big Data and Privacy Working Group here at the White House. On January 17th, President Obama spoke about the changes in technology that we use for national security uh, and what it means to our privacy. As part of that speech, the president recognized that technology is changing uh, the relationship between citizens and privacy more generally uh, than just in that national security context. And so he asked uh, that we conduct a 90-day review here at the White House of big data and privacy, how it affects the way we live, how we work, uh, and the way that big data is being used by universities, by the private sector, as well as by government. We know this is a complicated issue. Technology is changing rapidly uh, from sensors all around us to the ability of companies and government uh, to analyze and uh, look at vast volumes of data. If you're watching this video, I know that, that you're interacting with technology all the time, shopping online, carrying a cell phone, uh, you visited your doctor uh, who's using electronic records. So we'd like to hear from you on the question of what are the technologies or uses of big data that you think are going to be the most transformative to the way you live and work? Is there one technology in particular that gives you pause? I know this is a big topic, but we really would like to hear from you. So go to whitehouse.gov slash big data and let us know what you think. We'll be gathering a lot of different comments, and you can expect to hear back from us as this process proceeds. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this, and I hope you'll go to the website. So that material will be available momentarily, uh, and I hope you get a chance to pass it around to your friends. Um, at this point, I want to welcome uh, Nicole Wong to the stage. Um, let me now sort of introduce her. She is currently the Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer advising the President on Internet policy and privacy. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Nicole was the legal director at Twitter and the Vice President and Deputy uh, General Counsel at Google, primarily responsible for the company's products and regulatory matters. Please welcome Nicole Wong. Good evening, and thank you for that welcome. Um, some of you may know that uh, it's a snow day in DC again today. Um, this is actually the second time that we have held a big data event and the federal government was shut down by snow. So if you extrapolate that data, if you want to shut down the federal government, hold a big data conference. Um, on behalf of John Podesta and the administration's big data working group, many of whom are, are here today, um, I'd like to thank all of you for attending this event and joining what is a national conversation about big data and what it means for us as individuals, as citizens, and as a democracy. I also want to take a moment to thank the indefatigable Dana Boyd and her team at the Data and Research Institute, who organized an enormously productive workshop earlier today, as well as this public session, all in the midst of Dana's book tour and a half hundred other things uh, that are important for her to get done. This has been quite an inauguration for her new Think Do Tank, and we wish it the best as it continues to grow. I'd also like to thank New York, Law, New York University Law School and the Information Law Institute for providing a terrific venue for us all day. 
John gave some of the background on the big data study in the video that you just saw. And that video is not up yet, so don't go there to the website yet. Uh, but it will be part of a page that we are building at whitehouse.gov where you can go and provide feedback and tell us what you are thinking about big data. We also have a more formal process, uh, which was announced a couple of weeks ago, to receive written submissions that are addressing these questions in even more depth. And we look forward to your comments and ideas, which are going to inform the study. As John noted, one of the purposes of this study is to get a more holistic view of the state of technology, the increasing capabilities to capture, store, and analyze large and complex data sets, and then surface the benefits and the challenges that those technologies bring. So let me take a few moments to explain a little bit more about the review, its scope, and what you can expect over the course of the 90-day study. This is very much a collaborative effort, and John is joined by Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker, uh, Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz, the President's Science Advisor John Holdren, and the President's Economic Advisor Jeff Science, and other senior govern government officials like me myself. There are basically four channels of engagement. First, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST, is conducting a parallel study to explore in depth the current state of the techn technology and its trajectory from sensor capabilities to privacy-enhancing technologies. Their report will feed into this broader effort and ensure a substantive grounding in the technologies at issue. We actually have two of the PCAS members with us tonight, uh, Professor Susan Graham and Mark Gorenberg, um, who have been hard at work already starting to write and making me feel like I'm a little bit behind. Uh, second, our working group is meeting with a wide range of stakeholders. We have already met with the privacy and civil liberties advocates, with business leaders, policymakers, international partners, academics, and several government agencies, as well as a broad range of private companies. And we are reaching out to a range of sectors, such as the healthcare industry and the financial sector. And these discussions will continue over the next several weeks. We've also engaged with international audiences, including international regulators and other officials, to help answer the president's charge that we consider whether we can forge international norms on how to manage this data across borders, and how we can continue to promote the free flow of information in ways that are consistent with both privacy and security. Third, we are holding a series of public events, just like this one, to gather stakeholders from across disciplines and sectors and discuss the issues and questions raised by big data. Two weeks ago, we kicked off this part of the study um, at a co-hosted event at MIT, focusing on big data and the state of the art and technology. We're delighted to be here tonight at NYU to continue that conversation on the social, cultural, and ethical implications of big data. And I'm pleased to announce that we will be further building on these ideas at the University of California at Berkeley on April 1st. That will be the final in the series of the three events, and it will focus on values and governance issues. It's being organized by the excellent Deirdre Mulligan at the Berkeley School of Information and the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. And the event is open to the public, uh, and online registration should be open later this week. As Dana was saying, the webcast, the materials, and the summaries from each of these events will be available online following each of the workshops. And the conference organizers and participants have worked really hard to crystallize what they believe are the most important issues. So I hope you'll all take advantage of those resources. Finally, as I mentioned, we're developing ways to engage the public, such as through the White House website and through the public comment process. This is not a discussion that should be confined to Washington or to academia. This is an issue of such importance, encompassing an array of technologies that are already so pervasive that it requires public participation in the conversation about how we realize the great benefits of big data while protecting individual privacy and other values. So look for more of these opportunities in the coming weeks. This study is fundamentally a scoping exercise. We're trying to get a full view of the landscape, the technologies at play, their potential uses by government and industry and academia. We also want to examine the administration's consumer privacy blueprint, which was announced two years ago, including the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights and how its principles might be applied in this landscape. That may prompt us to look harder at some of our existing policies, at our research agenda, or at specific sectors where great gains could be made by the use of this data. 
When we complete our work, and the clock is ticking sometime in the middle of April, we expect to deliver to the president a report that anticipates future technological trends. It will frame questions raised by the collection, availability, and use of big data, both for our government and for the nation as a whole. It will identify technological changes to watch and ask whether those changes are addressed by the United States' current policy framework. It will highlight areas that may require further government action, funding, or research. While we don't expect to answer all these questions or produce a comprehensive review, or comprehensive new policy in 90 days, we do expect that this work will serve as a foundation for a robust and forward-looking plan of action. Let me turn for a moment to our first event of the series, which was at MIT a few weeks ago. And it was organized by Danny Weitzner and Elizabeth Bruce, who are with us tonight. Danny says that I'm a good delegator, which I think means that I have an uncanny, uncanny ability to find outstandingly smart and energetic people to help me pull off the virtually impossible. And Danny and Elizabeth did just that. With just a month to plan, they pulled together a roster of leading edge technologists to talk about both the potential and the challenges of using big data in healthcare, in education, in transportation, and other sectors. So I thought it might be useful to spend a couple of minutes to talk to you about what we heard at MIT. For example, Dr. John Gutag spoke about healthcare-associated infections, meaning infections that you get when you're in the hospital, and which are one of, it is one of the top 10 causes of death in the United States. Based on data from a small group of medical institutions, he was able to develop accurate models for predicting infection and thereby reducing the incidence of infections and the cost to the medical system. The data underlying those models included three years of information about medical procedures, the locations of those procedures, the locations of the patients, the room they were in, the other patients who were in the room, and the patients who were there before them. It also included the work schedules of the staff and patient histories. Now let me be clear, Dr. Gutag and his team were extremely careful with this data before, during, and after the, use of the collection and the use of the data. And they did the work with the approval and the supervision of their institutional review board. But he also made clear that this work just could not have been done with de-identified data. He and his colleagues succeeded in producing an effective model for identifying and preventing infections because they had access to the specific patient and care worker data. They could not have obscured it or diluted it ahead of time to ensure against any possible mishandling and still gotten the same results. And according to Dr. Gutag, just getting that data from this handful of institutions was extremely difficult for a complex of reasons, but notably because of concerns about privacy. So the societal question that Dr. Gutag and his research poses for us is how can we ensure that real progress in healthcare progress that will actually reduce pain and suffering is not unnecessarily held up by the rote application of outdated privacy frameworks. And Dr. Gutag is not alone. Similar types of work are happening now in the fields of education, energy consumption, genomics, and others where researchers are wrestling with privacy and liability concerns. So at least part of this study is also an exploration in whether there are tools at hand now or maybe developed in the near future that can help unleash some of this opportunity while appropriately protecting individual privacy and societal values. To that end, at MIT, we also heard about the state of privacy enhancing technologies, such as Professor Cynthia Dwork's presentation about her groundbreaking theory on differential privacy, which involves infusing d noise into data so as to obscure the identity of any single individual in the pool while still being able to resolve meaningful uh, results in the aggregate. We also learned about the cutting edge work being done on homomorphic encryption from Pre Professor Vinod Vaikuntanathan, which while still in its early stages of development, would enable computing over encrypted data and thus protect personal information that's contained within encrypted packets. There was some intense math happening at MIT. And at the conclusion of Professor Dwork's pre presentation, she urged us all to publish our epsilons which was fairly terrifying for the lawyers in the room. <laughs> One member of the audience actually got up and said, honestly, I don't understand a thing you just said. And every non-engineer in the room breathed a sigh of relief that they weren't alone. 
But that person forged on and asked a question about how do we think about data in the use of educational assessments? And Professor Dwork's initial reaction was, I'm not sure I completely understand your question. <laughs> but they continued to talk each other, talk to each other, and not past each other. And that is exactly the type of conversation we need to have. We need the people who are using the data and the people who are developing the privacy tools and the people who are thinking about the policy implications to really talk to each other, to not be afraid of the math, to not be distracted by the acronyms that policymakers tend to use, and to find a path forward. This is hard work. This is the essential work. We have already gotten so much good information and ideas out of the events held so far, but it's possible that one of the most important outcomes will be bringing together the diversity of stakeholders and fostering greater collaboration as we go forward. While we dig into those technical questions raised at MIT, we must ask broader societal questions as well. And that's why we're here tonight. As Dana mentioned earlier today, a cross-disciplinary group of leading thinkers in this area met to discuss a range of topics, including data supply chains and the accountability of algorithms, predicting human behavior, the inequalities in access to data, the inferences that we make from data, and what we should do when interpretations go wrong. The questions raised are not just whether we are using these tools responsibly and ethically, but also how our uses shape our society. This, too, is an essential part of the conversation. Anil and the panelists tonight will be drawing out some of these issues in the discussion coming up. Let me close with a short story about organizing these public events. When we were first pulling this series uh, together, the organizers, Danny, Dana, and Deirdre, asked me for some guidance on what issues should be addressed. And so to be clear, the outstanding content of the events is a product of all their work and their expertise and the symphony of smart people who have assembled to be a part of it. The only real guidance that I gave them on the substance is that we should not dwell for too long on the easy questions, not on the nightmare scenarios about the use of big data and not on the innocuous examples. Because I do believe we'll be able to find solutions to those issues. The hard work is in the middle. The cases where important values like fairness or non-discrimination or human freedom or health and safety or economic prosperity may be in tension with our desire to protect privacy when we use these big data tools. And not only do we need to make choices about whether and how to pursue those values, but how to build a technological and a policy infrastructure that respects those choices. I have been working on the issues of technology and privacy and individual freedoms for nearly 20 years now. We are at an important moment in our history and in the development of technology for all of those issues right now. We need everyone to participate in this discussion. We need to lean into those hard questions. So please enjoy the exciting discussion this evening, and thank you so much for being a part of the national conversation. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, at this point, I want to invite uh, the panel to come on up. Um, and I'm going to turn the stage over to Anil Dash, who's going to moderate the panel. Um, Anil is both an entrepreneur and a phenomenal cultural critic who writes extensively about how technology shapes and transforms society, media, government, and culture. He's the co-founder and CEO of a new app called ThinkUp and one of the co-founders of the consultancy Activate. He's also on the board of the Data Society Research Institute. Oops. Um, please welcome Anil. Good evening. Uh, it's so great to see you all. A lot of folks were here in the sessions all day, so it's been a long day for them. Some of you just showed up for Nicole's talk, which was incredible. Um, I want to encourage you. I know you got your laptops and your phones. You're generating big data as you're there. This is going to be a dialogue. You don't need to generate data right now. Um, what I want you to do is feel free to raise your hand, come to the mics, have a conversation and a dialogue with us during this event, because that's the whole point and the purpose of this. Um, 
what we're going to start with is an unusual thing, which is um, the panels where you go down the row and ask the same question of everybody over and over and over and everybody nods off, not doing that. <laughs> it's not, this is too good an opportunity. What we're going to do instead is exactly what Nicole asked of us, which is get to problems we need to solve hard problems, meaty, challenging problems, things that we're working on that are meaningful, stories that we need to learn about and know about to understand these perspectives. We have got folks that have worked in academia, people that have worked in finance, backgrounds that cover everywhere from Nike to NASA. This is a rare opportunity to think about all the dimensions of what big data means. Um, and so we're going to kick it off right with some great stories right from the top. Uh, first person I want to introduce you all to. Um, you know, Dr. Alondra Nelson is incredible. Her work as a professor at Columbia and as an author covers that intersection of what our genetic and biological selves that can be captured in big data mean and how that intersects with our identities as political and social people as we face in the mirror every day. And that is an incredible and rich vein of work uh, and, and, and a really important starting point for this conversation. So I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Alondra Nelson. Good evening. Thank you, uh, Anil. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Nicole, and both your teams for um, inviting me to be here tonight. So, um, Anil wanted us to sort of think about a question or the question that brought us to this conversation. And the question for me really um, drew on a decade of work of small data, small data on thinking about um, the social circulation of genetic ancestry testing and directed genomic, uh, directed, um, uh, um, direct to consumer genetics. Um, and so I found in the course of doing this ethnographic work and this field work that um, although social scientists and research scientists were likely to think about genetic ancestry testing as being definitely distinct from medical testing, genetic testing, and definitely distinct from criminal justice forensic DNA testing, that on the ground in the way that people thought about these testing, the, the, this kinds of a, these forms of analysis actually were kind of overlapping and relating, related in the minds of people and I came to see and talking to people that they were also overlapping in the way that they kind of socially um, function and circulate. And so my small data problem became a big data problem and this is really where I began. So um, to begin, I want to, before talking about this 21st century big data problem, I want to take us back to a 19th century thinker for, um, uh, uh, in, in particular, Walt Whitman and his song of ourself, myself, who writes, I am large, I contain multitudes. So this quote, of course, is taken from Whitman's signature work, Leaves of Grass, and I think for me it encapsulates uh, the issues that I want to raise in tonight's conversation. So I am large, uh, and thinking about genetic testing and genetic analysis in particular, large in the sense that the human genome contains an estimated three million base pairs, the big data of human life. And large also in the sense that genes that are rendered as data contain potentially boundless information about individuals as well as their biological communities, limited only by the questions we might hope to ask and the algorithms or other tools we might use to analyze or answer them. So the I and the I am large is the royal I. I contain multitudes, multitudes in the sense that genetic data contains information that be, can be used in varied aspects of society. Um, genetic data is multivocal. The same data may be used in genealogical, medical, or forensic domains, for example. So in other words, I want us to not forget that genes are omnibus, that they contain many types of information simultaneously. Um, and so in, in thinking about big data, I think that the individual collective uniqueness and identifiability of data for, uh, and its ability to use it for many purposes may, be, may make genetic information distinct among the other types of big data information that we'll talk about tonight, but this might be a debatable point. So I contain multitudes also in the sense that genes are transitional. Not only does gen genetic data not necessarily abide the classifications or constraints that we place around it, this data is also increasingly moving between institutions and organizations. This means that we need ethical guidelines and policies that are specific to the genetic data and the criminal justice system and the direct-to-consumer marketplace or in the medical setting. And at the same time, that can also take account of the fact that genetic data moves across and between these boundaries. So I want to present two examples that force us to think about big data outside of these institutional silos, examples that bring into relief, in particular, the particular vulnerability of uh, some communities, marginalized communities. So the first one. 
Most of you are aware of the story of Henrietta Lacks and of the cancer cells that were taken from her without her or her family's knowledge or permission and live on today as the HeLa cell line, thanks in large part to Rebecca Sklut's extraordinary book. Some of, a few of you may know that last March, a team of European scientists sequenced the genome of the HeLa cell and for a time made the sequence available online. Um, and they emphasize in this paper that they were really after sort of trying to get at some of the problems that Rebecca described in the book about using the, the HeLa cell line, right? And to, to use genetic analysis to be able to understand how that these cell lines might act in the laboratory. Um, but they also stressed in this paper, these scientists, that, quote, you couldn't really infer anything, you couldn't infer anything about Henrietta Lacks' genome or her descendants from the data generated from this study, close quote. However, we would soon discover that both health and ancestry information, not only about Henrietta Lacks, but also about her descendants, was available via the HeLa genome. Proving the point, uh, a researcher uploaded the HeLa genome to Snippedia, a wiki site that translates genetic information about Henrietta um, and easily came up with a good deal of personal information about Lax and her family. Um, and the Snip Pedia, those of you who are familiar with it, can reveal information about genetic markers for physical appearance, for disease predisposition, or for behavioral traits, right? So it contains a lot of information just based on the genome. So what was shocking about this, given what we know about the, the, how the HeLa cell line came to be, was a lack of concern about privacy and about consent, and the kind of abstraction of the data of the, of the genome that resulted, I think, in a kind of dehumanization of data, um, I think that we should be concerned about, and that should be foremost in our conversations about the implications, uh, the ethical implications of big data. Uh, so uh, there was a resolution to this that was happier than the resolution um, that uh, occurred for Henrietta Lacks in 1951 when her cells were taken at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In August 2013, in, his, in an historic agreement, uh, the uh, family, her family reached an agreement with the NIH um, that allowed for restricted approved access um, uh, of this data and application uh, of the, uh, and use of this data by researchers um, only for biomedical purposes. Um, but the research nevertheless will continue to reveal multitudes about the Lax family. So the second example I want to raise is an issue uh, of the issue of familial searching. Uh, genetic genealogists have long used DNA technology um, for at least a decade to identify roots and for longer still, law enforcement officials have used genetic technology to identify suspects. More recently, these two forms of genetic analysis have come together. These two practices have merged in the form of familial searching. The criminal justice system and police authorities increasingly use partial DNA matches to track criminal suspects with matches to members of their family who are already in a criminal DNA database. And the familial searching has been in the news a lot in the last few years um, because it's helped to, hi to solve um, several high-profile cases. Um, of course, the Grim Reaper case, serial killer case in Los Angeles, in which the DNA of a suspect's son led to the apprehension and conviction of a perpetrator. And a few years before this, the apprehension of the BTK serial murder, which was accomplished in part through the analysis of the DNA of the suspect's daughter, obtained through a sample from his daughter's pap smear sample at a public hospital. The uses of genetic data, of these uses of genetic data for familial searching, I want to remind us, occur against the backdrop of the growth of state and local forensic databases of people convicted of crimes and of those increasingly just merely arrested. This practice was solidified by the Maryland B. King Supreme Court decision last year that made it legal for police to take DNA samples when one is booked for a crime nearly. A decision that uh, conservative Justice Antonin Scalia described this way, quote, because of today's decision, your DNA can be taken and entered into a national database if you are ever arrested, rightly or wrongly, and for whatever reason, close quote. Given the racially discriminatory nature of the criminal justice system, um, in the post-Maryland v. King terrain, uh, familial searching poses significant risks for minority communities. For example, we know that African Americans comprise about 13% of the U.S. population, but more than 40% of people convicted of felonies annually, and a far greater percentage of persons arrested. Closer to home, recall that here in New York in 2011, under the stop and frisk regime, more black men were stopped in New York City than actually live in the city itself. As well, in the same year, 93% of black men living in the Brownsville, Brooklyn neighborhood were stopped by police. 
Thus, it is not a stretch to suggest that there are communities and families that are and will be subject to disproportionate genetic surveillance simply because one member of the family committed a crime or, importantly, was simply booked for a crime, whether or not he or she is convicted. So again, in this case, there's a case here of ge overlapping genealogical genetic foren and forensic genetics overlapping. And what I want to suggest is that we need a flexible, analytical, ethical, and regulatory approach to account for the inherent characteristics of DNA that make it informative simultaneously in these different uh, numerous contexts. So what's to be done? I think we need to be, continue to use specific institutional regulations, right? So I think that it's important that we have bioethical codes or uh, the FDA oversight and in medical um, institutions. But we need policies beyond these as well. Um, and there are two examples of regulatory lag with regards to genetic analysis, I think, that bear mentioning. So for example, although the implementation of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, the GINA Act, um, which prevents employers and health insurers from discriminating on the basis of DNA analysis, um, is partly helpful in the regard of, of sort of um, fomenting or holding back the discrimination that I'm talking about. Um, and in fact, there was so much hope for this act that the late Democratic Senator Edward Kennedy called the GINA Act, quote, the first civil rights bill of the new century of life sciences, close quote. But the GINA Act only applies to medical genetic testing. So there's no protection from discrimination from other forms of DNA analysis, be it in the criminal justice system or in a genetic genealogy system that can yield data or information about healthcare. Similarly, because most genetic ancestry tracing companies are privately owned and funded, and technically speaking non-medical, they are not considered covered entities and do not fall under the purview of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, or HIPAA, which guarantees that patients' genetic results will be kept private and protects him or her from potential discrimination. So these are two places in which uh, that we, that the, the, the silos, the institutional silos, the regulatory silos, I think do a disservice to the ways that individuals I've spoken to think about DNA testing and the way that it circulates in real life and increasingly the way that these things are overlapping. So I want to suggest that we need policies that take what I call the social life of DNA into account. We need to build a system of ethics and regulations that work both specific to the genetics of criminal forensics or medical genetics or genetics genetic genealogy, but also to how the social and ethical opportunities and challenges posed by genetic data um, circulate both between and beyond these as well. Thank you. That's extraordinary. So the next time somebody asks you what big data means, big data means somebody who could be innocent, who stopped and frisked and swabbed, having their data collected in a database connected to their family members and then it can be fed into what sounds like a barcode scanner that takes that SNP and tells you what it means about their health and it can be shared in ways that are outside the boundaries of HIPAA. That's today. That's not the future. That's not scary hundred years in the future. That's today. Pretty interesting. So um, <laughs> there's one starting point. The next one we want to go to, uh, Shamina Singh has an incredible career. One of the things that's most striking to me is she leads MasterCard's efforts, I want to get the phrase right, around inclusive growth which was most remarkable to me because that is something that exists. I didn't know MasterCard had efforts around inclusive growth. Uh, and like much of her career, what this means is this is work around taking, whether it's the financial system or our policy or our governmental efforts, to those who have the least in society and seeing how we can extend the benefits, the promise, the potential of these big data technologies to them to help them. So please join me in welcoming Shamina Singh. Thanks, Anil, and thanks, Dana and Nicole, for inviting me here today. Um, I think this room with some really smart people, I'm going to ask for your help tonight, because the MasterCard, but the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, who I'm here representing, um, we're wrestling with some pretty serious stuff that, um, that we think, with the information and the analytics that uh, MasterCard uh, has at its disposal, we can help solve some of these problems. So tonight I'm really going to pose some of these, let you know what we're wrestling with. Um, hopefully you'll do some thinking about it and maybe we'll uh, be able to get a chance to talk later about how to solve it. And the big issue for us is um, economic inequality, inclusive growth, the gap between the rich and the poor, financial inclusion, 
I don't know, these are all buzzwords that I know in uh, my small community, it's stuff that, that we're really thinking long and hard about. Um, we, write, we read a lot in, in the United States about the gap between the rich and the poor and the 1% and things like that. Um, for the Center for Inclusive Growth, we're really talking and thinking about 2.5 billion people around the world right now today who don't have access to financial services. 44 million of those people actually live in the United States today. Why is that such a big deal? Because these are the people who are most likely to be exploited in a cash economy, a black economy, an informal economy. These are the people who cannot or don't have the means or the access to save for a rainy day, to purchase goods and services online, things that you and I probably take for granted um, as a given. When in actuality, these are the people who are um, congregating at truck stops for child sex trafficking, sex workers across value supply chains that are still dealing in cash, that have not figured out a way to digitize their supply chains, have not figured out a way for governments to work with governments to figure out how to digitize their social subsidy programs such that benefit programs that are normally given in cash and paper are digitized and are, are given in a way that are allowed for people to actually get a card, go to a, any grocery store like you and me, and use the card like we would use a card, instead of having to go to a separate line, stand in a line for maybe an hour or so, pull out a bunch of paper so they can buy certain objects and certain materials from a grocery store, and then have to go back and, and recount all of those purchases to, as I learned today, many of their caseworkers. So this is the, this is the population that um, that I'm thinking about tonight, and that I'd love for your for your comments to help focus our efforts. and And why is Mastercard, to Anil's point, why is Mastercard thinking about this? Why did Mastercard create something called the Center for Inclusive Growth? Because Mastercard actually has access to analytics that can put a dent in this problem. And just just a couple of numbers to 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 tell you operates in 210 countries, 150 currencies, 36 million locations, $3.6 trillion were spent on some version of a MasterCard last year. 65,000 transactions are processed per second. How long does a transaction take? 130 milliseconds to transact. That's two times faster than a blink of an eye. So when we're thinking about this, we actually think we can be a force for good around this conversation because we have access to this information. But more importantly, we have access to the analytics around this information. Um, and we've been thinking about it for 40 years. So another thing you should know, I guess, um, as you're thinking about this financial collusion question and this e inclusive growth question, is that MasterCard actually isn't a bank, and it actually isn't a credit card company. I think the reason that Dana invited me here tonight is because she educates me every day of my life, but I think I actually helped her learn something new when I said MasterCard is actually the technology, the technology rails that talk between your bank, a, a merchant bank, and the consumer bank, and so all those conversations that need to happen to say, okay, this person wanted to buy something, this person actually has money to pay for it, well, I don't believe you, okay, check with the other person's bank, and then you confirm it with the merchant, and you're going around, and usually what's minimally a four-party four square, that's the thing that's happening in 130 milliseconds, 65,000 times per, I said second, but per minute. So that's actually what MasterCard is, or those rails. So when, you're th so when you're thinking about the information that's moving across these rails, it's anonymous information in that um, it takes your credit card number, your date, your time, the purchase amount, and what you purchase. So right now, there are about, I don't know, 10 petabytes, they tell me, uh, living in, in, in MasterCard's data warehouse. In the Center for, for Inclusive Growth, we're thinking about how do we take those analytics, how do we take all of that information and apply it in a way that addresses these serious issues around inclusive growth? And the answer is, I don't know. And we don't know. And that's why part of this is, that's why we're here today. 
because we're interested in asking. We've, we've asked the question. We don't know what the answer is, but we know that there are all these questions around how we have to think about and all these protocols. Um, and so that's why we're really glad to be a part of the conversation tonight. Um, I want to leave, I mean, and, and so that's, that's my big issue. I have a lot of stuff that I'm, that I'm worried about, but, but that's the big issue. And I'll, and I'll tell you why it makes a difference. Um, so one of the examples that we, that we talk about is that even in the United States, people who are getting electronic benefits uh, or food stamps or social subsidies, um, they go to a grocery store, they usually get them once a month, and they go to a grocery store and they purchase something once a month. So right now, when you look at the data, and people descend on a grocery store you know, once a month, all of a sudden what you're seeing, because the grocery store is doing their data analytics, and the government's doing their data analytics, and somebody else is doing their data analytics, what you started to see in a particular state was a spike in the food prices around certain, prices, certain times of the month. So what was happening was the people who had the least and who actually on social benefit would show up and have to pay more for their groceries because the data was saying that it was, there was a huge demand for these groceries. So because you know, X person or X company wasn't talking to Y company, wasn't talking to Z company, wasn't talking to the government, the people at the bottom of the pyramid were the ones who were being most exploited. Once, once that conversation happened, once the problem was identified, it was simple enough to solve. You just spread out the time and you, you get rid of the spike. But that's, that's, there's, so there's all these great things that happen with big data, but there, there are also things that we have to think about and are concerned about around big data and, and our use of that. And so, um, Another example, just very quickly, and then, and then I'll sit down, is around the world, and we all know what's happening in Syria, we've all heard what's happening in um, Somalia, refugees are traveling from their home countries and going to live in refugee camps in safe countries. Have you ever thought about what it takes to move food and water and shelter from places like the United States? When everybody says, we're giving aid to the Philippines, or we're giving aid to, to Syria. What does that actually mean? It means they're taking water, they're shipping water, they're shipping rice, they're shipping tents, they're shipping all of these things from all huge places around the world, develop, usually developed countries, into developing countries, using all of that climate, all of that energy, all of that shipping, all the fuel to take all of this stuff to these countries. And what happens, usually the host country is a little pissed off because they've got a bunch of people that they can't support inside their country and they don't have any means to, to support them. So one of the things that we have been thinking about is, okay, how do we use our information? How do we use our resources to solve that, to help at least address some of that? One of the answers, digitize the food program. So instead of buying the food, from all of these countries and buy, why not give each refugee an electronic way of paying for their food, their shelter, their water, their, in, a, in a regular grocery store in the home country. What it's done in Lebanon, it's created new jobs that didn't exist before. It's created commerce inside the country. So that now in Turkey, in other countries, so that now what's happening is shopkeepers, people who live in the countries right now are saying, Maybe it's not such a bad thing to host these people during their time of need. Not only are they providing jobs, but they're providing commerce and they're providing money. Because now what's happening is these same developed countries that in the past would donate goods are now donating the money. And the money is being electronically transferred from point A to their card. And it's a big, complicated system, like I mentioned before. But the outcome is that these people, these refugees, who have left everything they know are showing up in a new place and have the dignity now to shop wherever MasterCard is accepted? Can you imagine? So these are the things I'm thinking about. Again, working with people at the bottom of the pyramid, pyramid those who have least, to make sure that we are closing the gap between the richest and the poorest. So. Your ideas, your perspectives, your questions, I might not be able to answer them. Most welcome, but most of all, thank you for 
including us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Shamina. One of the incredible parts of that story to think about is we, we like good and bad. We like simple dualities. We talk about big data and we say, well, there's good and this, this big data solved the problem for us and there's bad and they violated our privacy and that's it. And think about a story where everybody is being a good actor. Everybody is doing the right thing with their data where they're saying, we're going to provide electronic benefits to people that need it to buy their food. Uh, we are going to be a grocery store, we're going to accept those benefits. We are going to be the person that's in charge of optimization for supply chain at that grocery store and we're going to say, well, when there's a spike, we're going to maximize our revenues by charging more for milk on the last Friday of the month. Everybody does the right thing with using the big data in smart ways, feeling good about themselves. And what happens is we end up with a lot of wasteful spending for people that are getting SNAP benefits or, or using EBT to pay for their food being charged for, for their groceries, right? So it takes connecting between these institutions across those silos to make that happen. I think one of those things that's really great to call out is that there aren't good guys and bad guys here. There are really a lot of complex problems that we only get by working well together. I think we got a question already. Yeah. Um, All right. Hi. So um, I work on the data warehouse for the New York City Welfare Department. And for the last, like, I don't know, at least 10 years, um, we give people's benefits out based on the last number of their case number, so it's not actually true that people only get benefits once or twice a month. So we weren't talking about New York, but yeah. thank okay. you. Just okay, good. Um, and this is great. There are a lot of very uh, varied solutions to this problem. Um, that brings me to our next speaker, who uh, I'm Again, and these are exciting people to talk to. Um, Stephen Hodes has done an incredible uh, range of things across both the, uh, the private sector and the public sector. I earlier alluded to him having brought NASA online as the first federal agency online on the web, period, right? Um, and so this great first step towards public engagement for a, a, an important civic institution. And today he's taking that same spirit of innovation to our schools right here in New York City. Uh, leading the effort to bring innovation, Innovation NYC, to uh, the way that we teach our kids. And so I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Stephen Hodes tonight. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to close this. Yeah? Okay. Um, so um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And, and thank you, Dana, for the chance to participate in this fantastic discussion. Uh, for the record, these observations are my own thoughts. They don't represent any statement of policy by the New York City Department of Ed. And, and I'm going to tell you a story, I think, which is sort of about the search for bad guys, um, because uh, people like a good guy, bad guy story. In, in 2011, the Council of Chief State School Officers launched a project called the Shared Learning Collaborative. Uh, which was an effort to modernize the storage of student information to be less expensive, more secure, and have the potential to make teaching and learning more personalized. The data would be stored in a consistent and uniform format. It would link to common core instructional standards and resources and be accessible via API to an ever-expanding array of dashboards that would be chosen independently by teachers, parents, and administrators for their own use. It would be compliant with all state and federal laws related to the privacy and security of student data and provide local districts with full control over who has access to which fields and for what purpose, which is much more control than they have with most current information systems. The Carnegie and Gates Foundations contributed $100 million to fund the infrastructure and the organization, and in 2013, it launched in partnership with nine states. You may not recognize the name Shared Learning Collaborative, but you've probably heard the name it launched under, In Bloom. If you know that name, you probably also know that since practically the day of its announcement, In Bloom has encountered so much opposition that every one of those nine participating states has either backed out or has legislation pending that would bar its participation. What its designers had billed as student data backpacks intended to make educators more effective, was branded by opponents as a national database of student psychometrics run by unaccountable for-profits. And parents and legislators quickly decided they wanted none of it. That something so potentially useful and so much an improvement in functionality and security could become so stigmatized so quickly, I think says a great deal about the unease we're experiencing more generally over the datafication of our everyday lives. 
For a number of reasons, this agita is playing out most overtly in the domain of education, even if, as I believe, it taps wells of frustration from many areas of our modern lives. Not coincidentally, student data combines aspects of both consumer and medical data. Like consumer data, it records your actions and choices. Which classes did you take? What grades and test scores did you get? How often are you late or absent or disciplined? But like medical data, it also records traits and conditions that you don't control. Who's raising you? Are you poor? Are you disabled? Are you medicated? So the concern and anxiety we have about the datification of medical and consumer and all the rest of our behavior, whether that concern is rational or not, whether it's actionable or not, carries over into this realm. Increasingly, people feel that they, or in this case their kids, are being reduced through pervasive, relentless scrutiny and analysis to nothing more than the sum of their data, and that human knowledge and understanding are being replaced by algorithm. In a neat rhetorical shift that merits its own discussion, the term personalization has come to mean not more engagement with persons, but more automation and more mediation through abstraction. <laughs> When personalization is no longer a close synonym for humanization, but instead its felt antithesis, you're headed for dissonance, with dissidence not far behind. And K-12 is a great site for dissidence. Parents in this country have always claimed the right to determine schools' practices to a degree that is inconceivable for any other government service. As a parent, you expect to be able to meet with your kids' teachers pretty much on demand. If you don't get satisfaction, whatever that may mean to you, you expect to be able to meet with the principal and the superintendent and the school board. Go try that at the police precinct or the Department of Health or the DMV. You can't tell Google to stop taking pictures of your house or your pharmacy to stop selling your prescription data or the NSA to stop logging your calls. But if you suddenly don't like the idea of schools contracting with corporations to maintain student records, which they've done for decades and without which they can't function, you can do something about it, and people are. They're forcing a fight which neither Gates nor Carnegie nor federal, state, or local departments of education were prepared. Had parents been sought out early on, a discussion could have been had on a shared set of facts with specific strengths and weaknesses enumerated, debated, and perhaps addressed. Instead, in Bloom, characterized as a fait accompli conspiracy of rapacious for-profits, unaccountable foundations, and an intrusive federal government, became a battleground between people for whom data is simply a raw material for the work that they do, and those from whom data is extracted under circumstances, terms, and conditions they don't control. In a recent interview about data policy, the Deputy U.S. Secretary of Education said that creating overly restrictive legislation based on vague concerns about security would be like not buying nice things because of a fear that a burglar might steal them. <clears throat> the problem is the parents don't feel that the benefits of these nice new things accrue to them, but that the risks do, even if they can't quite articulate what those risks are. They don't want yet another set of eyes casing them, sizing them up, reducing them to a potential asset class or target. To its advocates, in bloom is a cross between clean, renewable energy and Santa Claus. <laughs> to its opponents, in bloom is a cross between Big Brother and Big Tobacco. What are the potential benefits of those nice new things? Those of us in this business think every day about the uses of data to transform schools. We take for granted that the accumulation of finer and finer data points linked to learning standards, instructional objects, and the whole universe of educational inputs and outputs will enable the refinement of instruction to a laser-like precision, the instructional equivalent of medical treatment uniquely targeted to each patient's genetic code. Deploying a different metaphor, Rick Hess, Rick Hess and Bor Saxberg recently wrote that, quote, educators need to start approaching classroom challenges as learning engineers. But most parents would respond, no, they don't. Nor should they approach classroom challenges as psychometricians, physicians, or technologists. Parents and most teachers don't want to reimagine teaching as analyzing a cohort, curing a disease, or programming a robot. They don't want to think of kids as patients subject to continual diagnostic procedures 
or as knowledge repositories to be relentlessly queried for fidelity any more than they themselves want to be reduced to the sum of their shopping patterns or healthcare consumption. Parents want schools to know their kids as people, not percentiles, through conversation and caretaking, not analysis. They want their teachers to be patient analog craftsmen, not maker bots instantiating instructional CAD. <laughs> Fortunately, these fears don't mirror reality. We know that the tools that educators most embrace are the ones that lighten the burden of administrative and analytic tasks so that they can engage more effectively with their students' individuality, and those that help them to connect as professionals with their peers and as allies with students' families. There's a tremendous level of teacher enthusiasm for these supports, nearly all of which rely, like all modern software services, on ubiquitous access to current data, exactly the sort of thing that InBloom was built to support. The crucial error of InBloom's evangelists was not at the outset creating software for parents, designed from a parent's point of view, accessible, tangible experiences that would transmute abstract data into rich, relevant information for them. That mistake is unfortunately symptomatic of much government and foundation policy making. A simple failure of empathy and the basic principles of marketing that could have been avoided with a weekend seminar in user-centered design. This failure of policymakers to meet parents on equal terms with compelling services that clearly benefit their kids is particularly poignant because school governance is uniquely structured for accessibility and responsiveness to its constituents. But it also creates a powerful, if uncomfortable, opportunity for government and individuals to engage around the facts, rather than each reflexively trying to legislate away the monster under their particular bed. Education, particularly on the local level, is an ideal site to prototype the kinds of conversations about data that need to take place between citizens, government, and commercial institutions. The scale is right. The stakes are high enough to matter, and the outputs can serve as templates for others without requiring uniformity or imposition. The defining characteristic of robust innovation is learning from failure. The current regime of student data is seen as a failure by all of its stakeholders, though by each for very different reasons. The question now is, what will we learn? Thanks. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll get the screen up together. I think one of the extraordinary things there, and I, I'm glad I didn't spoil the surprise that uh, Stephen was gonna talk about in Bloom, because one thing we should reflect is, it's such a, it's such a fraught issue that for someone in Stephen's position to even mention in Bloom that it was actually an act of courage, yeah, I think. Right, for <laughs> even that kind of even-handed, very fair discussion of it. Um, it's so radioactive, uh, because these issues are that fraught. Um, that it was very brave. So I appreciate, Stephen, very much uh, you taking the time to educate us all on how that happened. Um, our final speaker before we uh, jump into the, the more animated dialogue here, and do get your questions ready, because I'm going to let you guys do questions right at the beginning, um, is, is Kate Crawford. And Dr. Crawford is incredible. She's been reckoning with the social and cultural and ethical issues around big data for many years now, and I think uh, one of the things that's most excited is, exciting is that there are the implications of these network technologies around policy and governance and the ways we conduct ourselves in public and the ways we work together to make our civic public. And so uh, we're going to have uh, a few slides and a great talk uh, from Kate Crawford. So hi, good evening, thank you so much for being here and a giant thank you to Dana and Nicole for making this happen. Because I'm the last speaker, I'm gonna take the prerogative of giving you some images to look at so you're not just looking at talking heads. Uh, but I'm gonna start with a story. About five years ago, I started working with big social data sets in post-crisis environments. In places like this, this is Queensland in the north of Australia back in 2010. And this was when we were experiencing the worst flooding on record and we had a floodplain the size of France. 
And I was working with a small team of scientists looking at the social media traces that people were leaving during this event, trying to analyze their communicative practices and hopefully learn some lessons for emergency services, for ways that they could adapt to these kinds of events in future. But even at this early stage of crisis informatics studies, we were noticing some problems. Some of those problems were about representativeness. So, so basically, the, the Twitter stream that we were looking at uh, was very much centered around the big cities, whereas in actual fact, the majority of the damage and the loss of life was happening in the small towns and basically the rural areas, places that were less tweet heavy. So there was automatically a bias towards an urban, more affluent experience of this particular disaster event. And then there were privacy questions as well about gathering data from people who are basically going through the most vulnerable experience in their lives. Well, fast forward by five years and a lot has changed. There's been a massive public and private investment in big data and along with that an expansion in particular forms of scientific and business innovation. But I've also been really concerned by this kind of thing, which is a frenzied land rush for data, where companies are effectively grabbing as much as possible without people's knowledge or consent, and sometimes using it in ways that are either unethical or discriminatory. So for me, the key questions in my research now have become, what kind of ethical frameworks are we imagining here? What legal approaches would support fairness and respect and how do we give everyday people more power and agency in this new data ecosystem that surrounds us? Now, many of you know a study that came out from Cambridge University last year, which took the likes of 60,000 people on Facebook and then used them to create a predictive model about some very sensitive information, like their sexual orientation, their religious beliefs, uh, and even whether they were a drug or alcohol user. And what they found was that with this predictive model, they were actually very good at predicting certain things, like whether you're Caucasian or African American. They had 95% accuracy in that area. Right after that was gender, and then it was male sexuality, and then way down the bottom was female sexuality. Apparently, we are much harder to predict. Um, but essentially, what I thought was really interesting about this paper is that the researchers wrote a very strong warning at the end which is to say that this Facebook data could now be used by employers, landlords, governments to discriminate against individuals without anyone knowing. So ultimately, many more sources of data are now personally identifiable. And this can be seemingly innocuous things like unscented hand lotion, which was effectively the exact trigger that Target used when they predicted that a teenage customer was pregnant and then exposed that information to her family before she could. By analyzing these low-level data traces, predictive analytics often operate completely outside of our current privacy protections and often beyond many of the ethical boundaries that we might be comfortable with. So essentially, predictive big data approaches are using these data traces to generate decent guesses of what might be PII, or personally identifiable information. They're essentially imagining your data into being. And when those predictions present a substantial privacy concern or they're used to make an unfair adjudication, it can create something that I've called predictive privacy harms. Now, our lives can be pieced together from these tiny glimpses like a purchase or a Facebook like or your social graph. And like any Frankenstein creation, that reconstruction of identity can be both frighteningly true to life and also just completely wrong indeed. And our existing regulatory schema are incapable of keeping pace with this kind of experimentation. So now we've got computer scientists like Arvind Narayan saying that virtually everything is PII. Anything that I can identify you from somebody else can be used to re-identify supposedly anonymous data sets. So this can produce some pretty serious problems, and I'm just going to briefly mention two that I've been working on. One of the promises of big data is that because you can conduct analysis at a mass level, you can avoid group-based discrimination. Yet big data is, as we know, used exactly for this purpose. Big data isn't gender blind or color blind, and we know that in advertising and marketing, it's being used to put people into ever more precise categories. 
So historically, the practice of denying or charging more for services like housing or insurance or healthcare was called redlining. And that was a term that came out of the 1960s from the sociologist John McKnight when he was studying the entrenched discrimination of black urban neighborhoods. But of course, under the much friendlier rubric of personalization, big data can be used to isolate specific social groups and then treat them differently, something that things like the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was designed specifically to prevent. So the difficulty here isn't that big data discriminates. We already know that it does. It's that you don't know if you've been discriminated against. So you won't know that you didn't get a job because your Facebook likes indicate that you have too many beers down the pub occasionally, or that you won't get a loan because your search history correlates with somebody who's a poor credit risk, rightly or wrongly. So the second big area is, of course, health privacy. Now, we heard a bit about HIPAA from Alondra. And HIPAA is actually providing us some of the strongest privacy protections under US law. But our online behavior can unintentionally reveal so much about our health. Like the, the minute you start feeling sick, you put your symptoms into a search engine, or maybe you like a disease foundation on Facebook, or maybe you buy an ebook about being a cancer survivor. All of these little signals can be used in models to provide a very sensitive view on your state of well being. And that's happening completely outside of the protections of HIPAA. So, as the legal scholar Nicholas Terry likes to put this, Bringing HIPAA to big data is kind of like bringing the old knife to a gunfight. So in light of these predictive capacities, what can we actually do about it? Well, traditionally, American civil privacy protections have focused on regulating three main activities, information collection, processing, and disclosure. But how do you assess the possible harms from a single point of data, a like, or a purchase, or a search? So there's this fundamental mismatch of regimes Privacy law is primarily concerned with causality, and a lot of these big data techniques are concerned with correlation. So where in the chain of all of these activities can we place any kind of accountability? Is it at the site of where we start to collect the data? Is it the algorithms? These are actually very difficult problems. So to try and answer at least part of this problem, the legal scholar Jason Schultz at NYU Law and I have been working on this issue, and we decided to go back, way back to 1215 and the Magna Carta. So this is actually King John signing the Magna Carta on the banks of the Thames. And this was actually the first document that forced a king of England to limit his powers by law and protect the rights of his subjects. And that definition that's being signed right there is actually still present in the US Constitution when it states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So how do we make this work in these unregulated big data spaces? Well, in a recent paper, we've outlined a baseline protection that we call data due process, which is basically placing accountability at the very end of the chain when a decision is made using all of this data. And that decision, if serious enough, should mean that an individual should have the right to know that big data has been brought into this particular determination, and they should be able to challenge that determination, and they should also be able to correct the data if need be, because we all know that these large data sets often have serious errors within them. And how much due process you get could depend on how serious the determination is. So obviously in areas like health or employment, you'd have a lot of due process, whereas in areas like advertising, probably a lot less. The benefit of this kind of approach is that it's focusing on the fairness of how a data-driven decision is made, not on protecting a particular category of data like PII or a particular industrial sector like health. And I think Alondra has also pointed to the dangers of this sector-based regulation. Because the uses of big data are so varied, we're going to need these highly flexible models that are based more on values and ethics and less on chasing down specific industries or specific data mining techniques, because let's face it, they're changing all the time. Ideally, we want to stop things like this, <laughs> because, frankly, as things stand, we don't even have basic due process rights, and we know that companies can sign away their accountability with these kinds of dodgy terms of service agreements. And we've seen from the excellent work of people like Virginia Eubanks, who's here tonight, and also Sasha constander chalk at MIT, that the harms of big data are unevenly distributed. The greatest impacts right now are being felt by marginalized communities, people of color, and those on low incomes. So what are we going to do about it? Well, 
obviously having events like this and having discussions is going to be really important. I happen to think we really urgently need to create some frameworks for ethics and justice around the use of big data. And perhaps it's no real surprise that this is the least developed area in this you know, rapidly burgeoning field with all of the billions that are being spent both by the public and private sectors on big data right now, very little has been directed towards thinking about ethics in data science or data literacy for communities or these basic legal protections. As somebody said earlier today, in a certain way, we're not really talking about data. We're talking about power and addressing these now massive power asymmetries between big data companies and the rest of us is the biggest challenge that's driving my work. Thanks. Thank you all. All right, I know we've got questions. Don't be shy. Come up to the mics, get ready for them. I'm going to start with my own personal question because uh, you all do amazing work and I'm curious and I actually just want to ask you this. So I'm a technologist and we always pretend that the techies who make the big data tools are just like these benevolent code gods who just do nice things because they like to do nice things and sometimes they get rich. Um, but um, that's not always the case, right? There are sort of values baked into our software. I'm curious because you, you have this broad range of things you all do and broad range of backgrounds. How closely do each of you work in the, in the work that you do with someone who actually codes and builds big data systems? How often do you interact with the person that actually gets their hands dirty? Or are you one of those people yourselves? Uh, Kate's going first, go. All the time, no, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have the pleasure of working in an industrial research lab where we mm -hmm. have experts in machine learning and information retrieval. And for me, part of the reason I got interested in this space was by seeing what you can do. And there are some pretty extraordinary options, both in terms of producing fantastic innovations and also, I think, some of these more serious concerns around areas like discrimination. Mm -hmm. But it, it's working with people who are actually generating code and thinking about machine learning algorithms that you can really figure out where this space is going. Right. And so, I mean, an organization with 10 petabytes of data, how, and, and you're fairly senior in the organization, what does it take to get sort of hands dirty and see what it looks like to work with that kind of data? Actually, not that much. There's, Good. Um, uh, MasterCard around the world has um, 6,000 employees. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that's not very many. No, compared relative, to the size, it sounds Relatively, small. and I think I saw, I don't know, some folks here were, are actually here from MasterCard Labs. And so, they're literally down the hall for me. So, it's... It's pretty that's, easy for us to hang out that's and very have surprising. some good conversation. And Stephen, what about your work? What, what does it take to look at the data that schools work with? Most of my work um, with uh, external partners is the early stage community of developers and investors, um, a lot of whom aspire to big data but haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting, the largest school district in the country, right, 1.1 million kids, 135,000 employees, $27 billion budget, um, we run on information. We generate a lot of it. In theory, we could be disseminating a lot of it, and actually we do, um, just in fairly inaccessible forms like paper and PDF and Excel spreadsheets. So actually, I think one of the challenges is, and, and other districts are not that different, um, one of the challenges is to get school districts to function more like big data in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. How about your research? Uh, initially, I started working with a lot of different, or looking at a lot of different direct-to-consumer um, uh, genetic ancestry testing companies, and I ended up working primarily on a company called African Ancestry. And so uh, the company started in 2003 when I started my research, and so I've watched their database get bigger from you know, something like 18,000 uh, you know, unique African uh, genetic samples to something closer to 30,000, and I've watched as the, and, and you know, talked and interviewed the chief scientific officer as they went from looking at sort of eight markers to make determinations about race and ethnicity to um, significantly more markers. So um, I'm not in the lab, but I'm, right. you know, I've certainly been watching the kind of algorithmic process sort of evolve over the last decade. And what are some of the things that jumped out? So in the particular case of people doing their own genetics, study, their own history, what are those sort of early stories that jumped out where you thought, this is completely different than I thought it was? Um, I guess uh, that people were more complicated and more nuanced in taking up the data than I mm -hmm. thought they were going to be. So um, I think that I thought that they would, someone would tell them that they were Yoruba or Igbo or Celtic and they would take up that information sort of wholesale and run with it. Um, but there's a, you know, you find this I think when you're working with micro data anyways, but there's a kind of process of negotiation and people think about, you know, what they know about their family from other sources of information and sort of weigh that against uh, the genetic testing data and, and sort of come to their own conclusions. So often. there's no 
no absolute authority to just because the, the genetic code says this. Well, that's because this is a this is a, a an institutional a space that's con, a consumer space. So people mm -hmm. feel like they have a lot of volition. There's not a lot of space in the criminal justice system for. Um, right. It's having, fuzzy if you're buying it, <laughs> yes. but it's not fuzzy if it's inflicted on you by the cops. Precisely. Yeah. Got it. Over here. <laughs> hi. Thank you for. Hi. Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is around security. Uh, security comes in multiple perspectives, from an uh, individual consumer to a business, interacting with a government, interacting with a company, an NGO. W what is your thoughts on, from a policy, on a government basis, and on a company basis of a data bill of rights, of non-hashtag, non-encrypted passwords? What are the rights that consumers, businesses should expect as data is transferred in business transactions and as individuals, or what they should expect from other parties. I'm going to direct this to Shamina first, and then everybody's going to answer. Thanks, Anil. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, uh, I'll answer what I think I can, which is I think it's a good point that you've raised, that there is a conversation around security that's actually a little bit different from a conversation around privacy. Those are two similar but different conversations. Um, I know at MasterCard, uh, the MasterCard has never been hacked, and that's partly because uh, they have their, a private um, conduit, so all of their things are not web-facing. And so, um, but the bigger point here is that in the, in the value chain of a transaction, there are multiple players, and making sure that, as a consumer, making sure that you have faith or you trust every piece of the chain in the transaction <coughs> is primary. So knowing when uh, a cash register uploads your data to a MasterCard thing, there's are two different, two different pieces of the chain. So understanding that there are multiple players and questioning whether or not you trust if your child's library or your school fees are investing as much in security when you give them your bank account information or your credit card information as another as an Amazon or somebody else. So not all security um, merchants are created equal. I, I do want to call one point which uh, Nicole had mentioned earlier. Uh, just over two years ago, the President put out a, a privacy bill of rights that uh, came from the White House. And um, it, it's an interesting starting point for at least part of the dialogue, I think, in, in deference to them being one of our hosts. Certainly worth checking out. Um, even on its own merits, it's, it's an interesting starting point for the conversation. I think, Kate, I would love to call out some of what how you've looked at the overall sphere of how people develop trust, because I think both privacy, security, all these issues really are grounded in trust. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, one of the ways we could think about this problem is that data is leaky. And if there's anything we've learned in the last couple of years, it's that enormous data sets are going to be exposed, sometimes <coughs> by accident, sometimes by malicious intent. There's a whole lot of ways that, that data will leak. And I think, it, I think it raises a lot of questions. It almost, um, it touches on this question of trust, but it also touches on our questions around you know, our expectations for this space. That when people tell us, hey, this is completely secure data, there's no way it's ever gonna escape, you know, you should give us your data and feel absolutely confident that we, you know, it's in safe hands. I, I would be very critical of that, and I'd be asking some questions, because I think what we've learned is that even the most sophisticated systems have the potential to leak, and then what happens with that leaked data is that it can be used in ways to reflect on existing public data sets, and then we get to see really interesting forms of data analysis where you have this very sensitive data, say it was like a social security database leak, uh, mm -hmm. with a whole lot of private signals and public signals together would give you extremely insightful, and in some cases very scary information about wide sectors of the population. So I think this is one of the key issues moving forward, and I think it means that we all have to be, you know, a little bit more skeptical when people tell us that data is going to be secure. Your earlier uh, phrasing of it that all, you know, we talk about personally identifiable information, but all information is personally identifiable exactly. information. Yeah. I think that was very insightful. Thank you for your question. We're going to go over here. Hi, my name is Akiva, and I want to thank all of you for talking about uh, sensitive communities. I think that's a, an incredibly valuable insight from this panel today. My question is for Shamina. Uh, yeah, you gave us a story about the same data being used uh, as a two-edged sword almost. It's one, the same set of data being used by a retailer to give dynamic pricing, raise prices of products at a certain time of the month, and then the same data being used by you to discover that problem and remedy it. Uh, and I would really like you to tell us 
I mean, how did you get them to change? You just told us, we found out the problem, we got them to stop. How did you do that? Uh, it's the communication. So, um, and I can't take credit for getting them to stop or start. Um, usually it's a government program, and usually the government has the ability to, um, once notified of the issue, can actually very quickly make a lot of things happen. Um, that they need to make happen. And so I think that particular instance was one where all of the actors, to an Anil's point, um, thought they were, they were doing the right thing for, I think, they had the right intention. Uh, there was just not, the connection wasn't there. And once that was, that, that was figured out, the government um, made the call. Uh, I want to actually extend that question to you, Stephen. Is this, this, once you see something, how do you make change happen in an institution? Because we don't, and I think even to a larger point about stop and frisk, like the data can be there. That doesn't mean the institution is, does the thing that the, the community that's necessarily marginalized prefers. How do, how, do you, how do you use data as a lever to make an organization do something? Boy, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that the, the significance of data and how it functions as a lever or a fulcrum um, in government um, works really differently than how it functions as, as it faces government thinking about its own operations and its mm -hmm. own values tends to function differently than how government uh, interacts with the people it serves. Um, and I think that, um, you know, anytime you have large market power, um, like a large organization does, you have the ability to make people comply with your contracts, right? So in theory, and this is sort of a little bit like what Shamina was talking about, uh, a large school district has the ability to make its vendors do whatever it wants, right? Um, the, the challenge is to make sure that what they want their vendors to do is optimal, or at least not pessimal. Um, and um, a lot of this comes down to, uh, strangely, issues of procurement. Um, what incentives do you create for your partners to do the right thing, to give you their best thinking, as opposed to their most compliant thinking? Right. And almost by definition, when a large institution, which has many subjects, as government does, um, makes an imperfect decision, as it will because it's human and it's imperfect, the consequences of that imperfection are in some ways much greater than when an individual makes an imperfect decision, uh, and yet government is no more well established to be perfect than, than people are. Um, so I, I think the question is how do you get the institution in some ways to think differently about risks and benefits and responsibilities, and it's especially hard in a politicized environment um, where you know, one of the things they optimize for is no bad headlines in the New York Post. Right. Whereas the things that you I would identify as innovation, especially around big data, necessarily are going to cause bad headlines at some points, especially if the data reveals something negative. Or the risk of them anyway, and it's a question of how much risk can the institution tolerate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to further this point of sort of how do you get things done, Alondra, I want to sort of prompt you about um, are, what are the ways that activists and activism has been informed by data? I think about, um, you know, we were talking earlier and this idea of, you know, the, the, one of the most terrifying images of, of, of the Black Panther's ascendancy is, is these young men walking down the street with rifles. And today we don't see an equivalent of young men walking down the street with iPads indicating their, their sort of their fluency and their literacy uh, and, and their modern tools of organization. What is a way that you think, you know, the contemporary activists are, are, if they had the spirit 20 years ago, 40 years ago, are going to use these big data tools? Yes. Um, so I write on the Black Panther Party. It's not a total non sequitur. Yeah, right. Neil wasn't it's just a little like, radical. Sorry. let's talk about the Black Panther Party. Um, are y'all terrified yet? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, I think one of the interesting things, you know, the original name of the Black Panther Party, you, militant radicals, was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, and they were engaged in stopping police harassment in their communities. And I think one contemporary analog of that is um, the use of uh, cell phones and, um, you know, PDAs to record arrests. It's very much the, you know, the Black Panther their party saw themselves as being involved in policing the police and you know there's an extension of that and the way that you know cell phones and um these kinds of, of records are kept. Um, I would say, though, going back in history to think about activists um, and the Black Panther Party in particular, is that you know the organization was 
Interesting in that in the 1970s, they were talking about genetic information and genetic data. So part of what um, I, I write about uh, briefly in my book, um, Body and Soul, about the Panthers health, health activism is a moment at UC Berkeley on the occasion of an international gathering of geneticists where the Panthers basically ask a question about how we frame questions about genetic information and say, we're not against genetic research, but we're against genetic research that only asks questions that sort of compare and contrast black and white people. Why don't we compare and contrast poor people? Why don't we compare and contrast Northerners and Southerners, right? So asking about the very kind of um, frames, the politics of the frames that go in um, to doing the work. So that's something that can be carried forward. And certainly some of the, the quotes, that the data that I was citing tonight about um, stop and frisk and about the, the, ways, the, the ways in which they just, this, these practices disproportionately affected certain communities in New York City come out of activist use of data, right? So taking the data from the stop and from the, you, you know, the police department using Freedom of Information Act and sort of running that data um, towards different ends. Very interesting. We're going to go to a question over here. Um, I guess it's, uh, this question came out of like this beginning of this idea is that this is the public and that this is actually a public forum which is kind of silly. Because like, I, I don't have a smartphone, and I also don't have a printer, which means that if I wanted to come here, I had to go to my place of work and then print out the ticket so that then that I could then come here to show it. And that there are these sort of structures in which sort of regulation that, that prevent actual access. And so you have this sort of false idea of the public that isn't really the public. Um, but I wanted to talk about that because you asked this question about what is your access to information within what you do. And you sort of talked about MIT. And MIT is on the forefront of sort of like corporate um, university partnerships in terms of how you get funding and grant work for the type of research that you're doing. And so it's a, a particular corporatization of the university and the corporatization of information. And that type of corporatization within other sort of non-private institutions leads to disinvesting in the humanities and in other things that are not sort of economically profitable. And so when we're talking about access to data and access to all these things, we're talking about like a really transformative change of what the public means. It's a privatization of the public. It means that you can collect data out and everywhere. And so like the very idea and the very sort of like basis of governance is, is sort of completely transforming. Um, and, and then I see that sort of like tied into also sort of like antitrust regulation um, in terms of sort of corporatization control. How do you regulate large scale sort of industry? Where do, like who has the most power? I mean, you talked about sort of distribution of food goods. That's owned essentially by one major sort of uh, food distributors. I work in a grocery store. Um, it, it's, it's highly consolidated. It's incredibly conglomerated. And so the, the, the sort of like the ability for the government to actually have actions is, is, sort, of, is, is sort of really specifically al aligned. Um, and so I guess I wanted to bring up this idea, what, are, what is the... What are the implications for this privatization of the public? Yeah, if I can, I'd like to tease that out into a couple separate issues because there was a lot packed in there. It was really good. I think one of the things, the first things that jumps out is the idea of the sort of separate from digital divide, there are the, the data haves and the data have nots. Mm -hmm. And um, we have people who are data invisible. Uh, one of the anecdotes that came up today was uh, cities that are using uh, cell phone reporting for uh, whether it's uh, potholes or speed bumps or cell phone tracking uh, are privileging neighborhoods that have smartphones for getting service for you know whose potholes are going to get fixed. And so what happens is that people that are digitally invisible because they don't have smartphones um, are suffering by not being part of big data. And then of course the other side of this very, very obviously is uh, uh, the communities that are being over indexed in uh, big data and being explored that way. Um, Shamina, actually I think this sort of parallels um, a lot of the conversation around those who are unbanked or underbanked. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, can you talk a little bit to that? Sure, I'll try. I mean, I can't, I, I don't think I can speak to the data part of the question. I mean, the proxy, I guess, that I use in my work is around financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you either, you have access to um, a set of goods and services or you don't. The one thing I guess I would um, po point to a little bit though, Anil, is that that might be true in the United States, mm -hmm. but in other countries, mm -hmm. People don't have to have a smartphone mm -hmm. to get as good or a service. Can, so, can you describe M-Pesa a bit? Because I feel like there actually wasn't as much familiarity with it as I might have expected from the audience. How many of you have heard of M-Pesa? 
a couple of hands. That's good. I still, I think it's an important story. You told it really well. I'd love to hear you yeah. articulate it. I'll tell you the story about Mpesa, but actually on this one, Please. to answer her particular question or address her particular question, in India, there is an NGO um, app called, because corruption is a huge issue in India, and it is in a lot of places, but certainly in India. But it's, a, it's an NGO called IPayToBribe.com. To, I to mm -hmm. And literally on your cell phone, which isn't a smartphone, by the way, it's a, it's a regular touch touchdown phone, you text in your, what you, who you paid a bribe to, how much it was, um, and what was it for, and you post it up on a, and, 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 they, and they collect all the data, so that literally what you're seeing is you're seeing a geographic representation of where the bribes were, and frankly, did they actually do anything? So uh, you, you can do potholes, you can do a whole set of standards, but the thing is, so they're, they're, they're in New York and they're US, um, models, but then there are also things that are happening outside where people don't have the same access and frankly the same barriers that we might have because we are such a developed economy. And very quickly, in Pesa, in Kenya, again, a country you wouldn't think necessarily would be leapfrogging the United States, Canada, Europe in their ability to transact, but 90% of people in Kenya are now transacting on their mobile phone currency, buying and selling. Because banking systems aren't strong right now in Kenya, and credit cards aren't strong in Kenya, and so everybody's trans and cash gets you robbed in Kenya, and so people are literally using their cell phones to transact, purchase goods, share money, remit, do whatever, and that's what everybody, at least in in my world, everybody's trying to figure out how do we replicate M-Pesa in other markets. So it's a very interesting. Um, potential solution to a problem. And actually extending that, this sort of person-to-person -person connection where big data exists outside of the institutions. I think a lot of the questions there were about institutions, whether it's those that are in charge of food distribution or the government itself or, or um, the way that uh, corporations are interacting with academia. Uh, a lot of this is mistrust of institutions, which I think is probably the through line that the, one of the rare things that Occupy and the Tea Party have in common, right? Mm -hmm. So Kate, to your point, a lot of your work I think is about how people organize together uh, what are the ways that people are going to be able to organize that are outside of finance or outside of economics but are sharing, sharing their data, say, for creating policy, creating laws, creating community? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I also want to respond to that question because I agree with the sympathy of it and I, I sort of understand where you're coming from in terms of asking those questions. But I think when we get to this point of how do we organize politically in these systems, it's actually become a lot harder. Let's, let's be really frank about that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure many of you saw the... Uh, the example in the Ukraine that happened on January 19, I think, this year, when people were at a public protest, and everybody at that protest received the same SMS on the mobile phone that said, you have been registered as a participant in an illegal, illegal protest. So, I mean, that's a fairly shocking example of how just going out to protest something in the street, in this case, the protest was about the over-regulation of protesting, um, can actually result in you being tagged and recognized as somebody who's actually a protester. So that, to me, raises a really yeah. serious question about how we organize politically in a big data era. Um, and it's interesting also to, to respond to the question about MIT and, you know, and corporatization, which you know, is, is true and absolutely on the public record. I can really freak you out by telling you about the other place I work, which is Microsoft Research, <laughs> which is like the universitization of the corporation. So what's really interesting is that this is actually happening in both directions. And what we can learn from this is that there's an incredibly blurred space now between the private and the public sectors. And this is exactly why our thinking needs to change in terms of how we start to regulate these spaces and why we need things like due process, why we need this idea of how do we reach the public if it's not as easy as just saying, oh, you know, I'll put out a tweet and hope that it reaches the public. So, I mean, while this may not be a perfect instantiation of what the public looks like, it's a lot better than just having data brokers and technology companies sitting at the policy table and making those decisions. Right. So our I think our this laws is, yeah. are based on the idea that there's a clear distinction between a corporation and a government entity and an academic institution. And that may not be true, and even if yeah. it is true, the data can still flow between yeah, all of them. Exactly. Right? And or, it's going to get a lot harder. Or even a distinction between an institution and something that's not an institution, which is right. increasingly blurry. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and that's actually one of the things I was, I was going to push into here, Stephen, two parts to it. One is um, it seems like a critical part of giving parents control over education is going to be giving students control over their own data. And, and one of the things that's interesting, putting aside sort of the in bloom example, is um, an increasing percentage of the technology that runs a classroom or that runs an organization has no vendor behind it at all. 
right? It's not being sold to them by Microsoft. It's not being sold to them by, by Google, but it's just a community built these tools. Uh, and one, where do we go to fix bugs? But two, if data are shared between all of the people that are running this software, who owns it if there's no entity behind it? How well, do you address those issues? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's tough to address them, but I think it's really important that we do, because if you've paid attention to what's going on in higher education, the whole notion of higher education as a coherent bundle uh, that's delivered by a single institution is obviously becoming unstitched. There are many alternatives and many more coming down the pike to what you would have considered a conventional four-year degree. That's coming slowly, uh, more slowly to K-12, but it's absolutely occurring. And so kids are having, no matter what age, are having more and more educational experiences for which they're seeking credentials and acknowledgement, uh, as well as information transfer and social validation outside of a particularly regulable institutions. Um, and, and one of the things I think we need to be uh, conscious of as we regulate is that we regulate uh, not for where we've been institutionally, but for where we're going institutionally. So there's an interesting through line here between, I think Kate's point two, uh, you need to regulate right at the point of contact with the person who's being affected by it, and your point of it can't be tied to an institution. It seems like there's some motifs sort of bubbling up here about uh, our current regulations around big data are really tied to institutions that the big data itself are undermining. As, a, as opposed to the behavior. Mm. Right, right. Right. Regulate the behavior in a sense rather than the entity. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. One more question over here. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, hi, Kevin Bankston, New America Foundation's Open Technology Institute. Um, one of the perennial problems we face in this, in this space um, for regulating technology at all is that uh, legal norms can't keep up with the pace of technological change. And this issue is a good example of it. Two years ago, after an intensive process, we had the White House issue this Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, basically the culmination of you know, 10 to 15 years of development in this space, um, with an eye toward that becoming legislation. Um, we haven't seen any legislation move. We have seen rapid change in the technology. And now here we are two years later already talking about what are the additional things we want on top of those other things that we, that we couldn't get. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it leads to the question, assuming that Congress is unlikely to pass legislation in this area, it seems right now they're unlikely to pass legislation in any area <laughs> most of the time, um, what are the pathways to change? And in particular, does it make sense, is it worthwhile to attempt to develop uh, spinning off of uh, Kate's uh, work, um, principles for data due process that we could then take to target a particular sector of industry or government and say, you know, we want you to do this. Um, is that a worthwhile endeavor and who should we target first? Let me sharpen your question even further. Please. I want to get it right down to something answerable and actionable. Talk to me about in my local community, I go to a school board meeting, I go to a community board meeting, I go to a city council meeting, what is the thing I can do or what is something that people have been doing around the way their data are used that would be effective? Kate's going to go first. Oh, thanks, Paul. Oh. <laughs> How have I told you how much I like you? You're welcome. <laughs> Well, I actually think there's a lot of things we can do, and, and I guess that's the, that's the optimistic side of my otherwise um, occasionally pessimistic research agenda, um, <laughs> is that you know, th there's, a, there's a lot of really interesting organizations that care about these issues, and I feel like this is a moment of coalition building. Um, I, I'm really concerned about when we try to frame these as being individualistic problems, or mm -hmm. we've got to try and you know, change our privacy settings, or you know, know all of the apps that are around, trying to gather data from us. I mean, it's, it's ultimately an arms race that we're never going to win when we pitch individuals against massive institutions and states and corporations. So I feel like this is really a structural set of questions that we're talking about, and it requires a kind of collective response. Mm -hmm. So I mean, to respond to your question, Kevin, I, I really think this is the right time for organizations like yours and others to start working in, in larger conglomerations to say, okay, you know, where are the sectors where we can start thinking about this now? I mean, you know, we've all got our own views on where that might be, but I think there are some really egregious cases of where people are actually experiencing discrimination right now because of these data sets, and they're the kinds of spaces where I'd say we actually need to start agitating. Thank you, Kevin. Do we have more there? I just Please. briefly, you know, one of the conversations we had earlier today in the workshop was about the, you know, a coalition of civil rights organizations who are working on these issues. So I don't have a, a kind of micro neighborhood example, but I think um, it's it's encouraging that the NAACP, the Urban League, the National Council of Raza are thinking about big data as a civil rights issue and sort of mobilizing um, that energy around it. I think it's a great framing over here. Uh, I'm curious about the extent to which 
pseudonymity uh, plays a role in what all of you do. I mean, it's a really different thing for each of you, I think. But um, I'm an engineer, so you know, I like the practical problem side of it. <laughs> and, I, and I'm starting to listen to some of these problems, and I'm thinking, well, we have this giant cloud of data out there, and everything is personal identifying information. But if there's actually an effective pseudonymity scheme between the data that's out there and then the person that it's actually associated with, and if there was more rigorous attempts to say, this is what pseudonymity should look like, then you can't actually combine the data across different sectors. To what extent is that practical reality? Does it undermine the purpose of big data? To what extent, in particular, Stephen, I'm thinking of you, would parents care that the data is really pseudonymous? Like, yeah. yeah. So I'm just curious to hear how pseudonymity factors. Let me combine some data. other ideas with that. Sure. So pseudonyms can be really powerful. There's uh, deliberately falsifying data. People do this mm -hmm. on, for mm -hmm. a variety of different reasons, where players or actors in the system do this. And then there's fuzzy data, right? So we sort of remove some of the precision of it uh, for strategic purposes. I think all of those are different tactics. What are the ways that can be used to sort of protect the values that we're talking about? So one of the things that uh, FERPA, for example, Federal Educational Records Privacy Act, is concerned with is not just a piece of individually identifiable data, um, but the fact that even if you blur the identity on that record, um, pseudonymously or otherwise, you are may be able to associate it with other records pretty easily that let you figure out who that person is despite the pseudonym. Um, and I would imagine that in the commercial sector or in the worlds of really big data, that's trivially easy to figure out who you are, um, even if your uh, identity is initially blurred. So I would, uh, on a technical basis, I'm not sure how effective a solution that is. Given um, sufficiently large data, nobody is pseudonymous. And it doesn't seem to have to be very large from what I'm understanding. <laughs> oh, good. That makes me feel better. Um, before we go to more questions, uh, this is, again, one of those just indulge me questions. Does anybody here not think tens of millions of social security numbers will be leaked over the next 10 years? <laughs> Show of hands. Anybody think that's not going to happen? So this conversation I've had in a couple of different rooms, and there's consensus. I've almost seen nobody who cares about these issues say, by pick a number, 2025, 10 to 100 million social security numbers will be leaked with the names attached to them, upon which our systems for veterans affairs, for uh, 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 SNAP benefits for uh, countless things uh, depend, and this would radic this would sort of radically skew the way that we transmit data about the most sensitive, vulnerable people in society and the benefits that we extend to them. Um, this isn't specific to any of the domains that you work in. I'm just curious about what happens after that. What does the future look like when uh, one of these sort of single important identifiers goes away? And, and Shamin, I'm going to start here because I think we have at least some precedent. I know, I'm sorry. With, um, with sort of disposable payment numbers and, and credit card identifiers and things like that, we've got a little bit more precedent around, uh, OK, that particular number isn't going to be the secret to unlocking everything that you own. So I think that is related, actually, to the engineer's question. And um, one of the things I know that uh, I can't speak to in detail, but I know that there are a lot of conversations happening um, around uh, virtual identification. And can you um, even anonymize your transaction even further? And the way that I think about it, and I don't know if this would be helpful at all, is, if, is the idea that you make your data the least less attractive than somebody else's data in terms of <laughs> the, being accessed. It's accessed. like putting the club on your data? Well, here, so remember those things when you drive where you used to put that thing, yeah, that bar club, across your the steering, club, the yeah. club? So it's not that somebody who didn't want to steal your car wouldn't, you know, they just go to a car that doesn't have the club. And so part of the, part of the, I think part of the trick or part, I mean, it sounds simple, but I think part of the, this is, um, and I, the, People are trying to figure out, for example, in the payment space, this concept of the mag stripe versus, that's very easy and very old, and now you can hack it pretty quickly and pretty easily, versus something called chip or the EMV chip, and transitioning from something that's kind of easy to hack and read the data into something that's harder to hack. But it, it doesn't mean that it's unhackable. It just means that it's just harder to, it's harder to get there. And so to your earlier point about you know, it's in your point about social security numbers and things like that. It's like, don't give your bank account information to anybody. Like, mm. because if you, God forbid, somebody gets access to your bank account, you're screwed. At least with your credit card or something or some anonymized virtual credit card number or a token or something that represents you um, but isn't you, um, you're making it much less attractive for somebody to 
to so access a little the layer of abstraction, please. Would it be possible to get Professor Sweeney? I don't know. I won't put her on the spot, but um, Latanya Sweeney works on precisely. She's written many exactly. papers mm -hmm. on, on, on precisely how <laughs> how people get you've access been, you've to been the data. Professor, I mean, I think. <laughs> if you're willing. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? That's nice. Yes, the professor. Repeat the question? <laughs> well, just about the, you know the social security numbers and the way that you know we can get access to data. You know, your your so many papers are so masterful on how you know intentional and unintentional data can be identified. Yeah, I mean even today. Please to the mic. I told you all it's a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just in terms of social security numbers. I mean, even today, there are just tens of thousands of social security numbers freely available on the web. And it's just, there's no shortage of ways. There are, um, one of our, one of my, in my class, we did predictions of social security numbers because they're really encoded numbers. So for anyone born after 1987, there's a correlation between your date of birth and the issuance of that social security number. Uh, Alessandra Acquisti was one of the first to sort of publish that, and we've shown uh, as that population ages, how much more accurate you can predict social security numbers and in which communities. And I could go on, but I will stop now. Thank you. Um, we're going to do one more question because we're a little tight on time. I think we're over here. Uh, oh, we got two. Okay, you're in luck. So we got just our first two at the mic. Howdy, Jerry Weinstein. I'm a free agent. Um, <laughs> Congratulations, Jerry. My good. question would be actually to Stephen. Uh, last week, a lot of students received offers for uh, many of New York City's elite schools. And uh, if, if you're unaware, less than one in 10 were for black and Latino students. So my question is, is there any effort to use uh, data for middle school, fifth through seventh, predictively to bring uh, testing preparation that might enable scores to rise? Because it, test prep has been the big differentiator of those kids who get in and don't. So there, there have been efforts over the past, going back at least a dozen years, to better prepare uh, underrepresented kids for that admissions test. The interesting thing about that, though, is that is not so much a data problem. It kind of hinges on the policy decision as to whether you want to make a single test the criterion for. I'm, I'm aware, but I want to Pull, push mm. back in the sense of how can we use data now that we have access and we can look at test results from fifth and sixth and we can correlate that around the five boroughs and isolate those students that might need additional help in different areas. I, 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 I think it's easy to imagine how you might do that and it's a question of is, is that does that become a priority and is that considered to be the shortest path I'm going to, to urge that. you two to follow up together after we're done sure. here. Appreciate sure. it. One more question. Okay. I may never have a chance to poll an audience like this, the question like this. I'm curious, how many people in this room have moved away from search engines that capture and keep your searches? How many people have moved away from search engines that capture and, and keep your searches? how many people are thinking about doing that? And I'm asking that question because I work in the arts, and I'm afraid this question may seem really out of date for this audience. But my friends and I, the question that keeps surfacing with us is feeling that we're losing a sense of a feeling of freedom of intellectual inquiry. When I'm writing and working, there, like, you can't even imagine what I might be searching and what I might search one. I might be reading about semiconductors and then I might be reading about extramarital affairs. I mean, literally, it's like a stream of consciousness almost when I'm really like working in a very liberal free way and I do use Google, which many of my friends have pulled me aside and said, you really shouldn't use that search engine. <laughs> and it's not because I have anything nefarious up my sleeve. And it does seem, I mean, I know that most of this focus seems to be on you know, medical information and social security numbers and bank accounts, which is so important. But to me, there's something subtle that's been happening, and I'm just sort of wondering, you know, like at what point legally is that going to be brought into the discussion more? It's really disturbing. I, I think it's vitally important to so the, the uh, oppressive effect on arts and humanities of this sort of uh, presumed thinking. surveillance culture behind big data. Yeah, right. And I, not that, not that, not. 
not in an obvious, ooh, those are bad guys, but mm -hmm. there is something just like you can't even go to the library and get a book out without there being a like. There's no way to. There's very. There are very few pathways to free intellectual inquiry without. Yeah, you know, somewhere it's being right. Involved. Well, and, and uh, Julia Anglin's with us so tonight, anyway, too, uh, to her point that, that increasingly the kind of privacy that certainly an artist would want to be afforded is, is starting to feel like a luxury and, you know, excess money is not a problem that artists are plagued with. Um, I'll start with Kate again, because I think you've, you've spoken to this point to some detail before. Is there a, a sort of a, a general chilling effect to the way big data is, is present in our yeah, culture? Um, look, I think it's a really, I think that's the, pre the pressing question of our times. I think we actually are facing a very serious state of cultural anxiety that in some cases is extremely well informed, in other cases, like, well, what can we actually do about this? And it's a, it's a, really, it's a really uncomfortable feeling, and I think most people in the room will, will relate to you in, in what that feels like. I mean, you know, we can think about what does freedom of association look like if it means that you have to double think every time you might want to go and you know join a protest or what does it mean if you know every single book that you've ever read has been recorded and we know exactly what page number you got up to and that tells you something pretty intimate about what's happening in somebody's headspace so i think these are actually real questions and i think there's this you know the so-called post snowden moment that's happening now is actually a very it's it's still very early days but people are now asking really difficult questions about what it means when everything leaves a particular trace. And I think it really, for me, gets down to these questions of what does democratic participation look like now? And how does that change the way we engage with each other? Do we, you know, do we start to, to engage in these somewhat more paranoid activities around what technologies we use? Or can we think about ways to pressure organizations, institutions, and states to deal with our data in different ways. I mean, even simple things like data retention can actually be really powerful to say that, you know, there, there are ways in which data isn't held forever. So look, this is, a, this is just me empathizing with you and saying I think it's a really difficult problem, but I think it's the problem that we're just starting to really grasp the severity of. And on the panel, are all of you still using Google, or have you moved to private mm -hmm. search engines? Or is that too personal of a question? I use it. No, no, no. I just, it's a big, it's a big deal. Um, just, is the consensus everybody still just using Google? I use for the most part? You use DuckDuckGo. Can you speak yeah. to that briefly? Yeah. I use DuckDuckGo. I don't know what else to that's say. A, that's such a, well, it's a considered choice. I think that's interesting. Okay. And, and I think at this point, with a sort of a, a reflective question about the, the artistic and maybe the more soulful considerations of big data, I hope you'll all join me in thanking Alondra, Shamina, Stephen. <laughs> Okay, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Thank you all. And very briefly, I'm going to embarrass Dana. Um, this event, we're very, very fortunate to be hosted by NYU and by the White House. Um, person for whom none of this would be possible without has been the extraordinary leadership uh, of Dana Boyd. Please join me. So thank you all for an absolutely wonderful evening. I think part of the challenge of these questions of big data is that there are so many amazing opportunities that are out there and so many complications to those opportunities. And I think that this tension of trying to tease these things out becomes a really imperative challenge for all of us. Because as these questions of data emerge, we can't really turn a blind eye to what's going on. We can't just pretend that it will go away and hope that it will. We actually need to embrace these conversations and we need to actually come together as a, as a society to think about what kind of society we want to live in. And that is really hard because we often hope that one, you know, segment of, of society will somehow solve it for us, that we could regulate this through law, that we could solve this through technology, that we can find the market solution, that we can just sort of hope it will all go away. But actually it requires all of us to really engage with these issues, try to understand it, try to become literate, and try to think about how we hold accountable all of these mechanisms. Because at the end of the day, these questions of big data are fundamentally questions about power. They're about the society that we live in, they're about the institutions that we have created, and they're about the ways in which we relate to each other as people, as institutions, as organizations, in a way that we want to build the world that we want out there. Now, I am so grateful to all of you for coming out tonight. And this is a sort of funny, funny situation. As I mentioned at the beginning, I kind of got thrown into doing this. I thought it would be a fabulous opportunity. But you know, the organization that put this together initially, the Data and Society Research Institute, really consists of three people. So we had to beg, borrow, steal, 
totally make, make friends with all of our sort of nearest and dearest and be like, please come and help you, come, come and help me. And I think that, you know, it's been an amazing testament to all the people that have really come out and, and really done this. And I want to take a moment first to thank um, my two teammates uh, at Data and Society for, for kickstarting this. And that's um, Ellen Menlo, who many of you met and sort of waving in the background, who's been fantastic. Um, Seth Young, who is unfortunately not able to be with us tonight, but I'm sure he's watching us from the live stream, sort of cheering us on, which has been great. Um, and some amazing people who sort of stepped up to the table uh, to really participate. Other sort of broader world of data and society, Mark Forscher, um, Alex Rosenblatt, Tamara, Nice, who have been just fantastic at putting together materials and making this work. Sarah Smith from Microsoft Research, who sort of jumped in board and just m helped us sort of project manage this whole craziness in wonderful ways. Amazing volunteers across all of NYU, and in particular, um, our, our collaborators and co-hosts, the Information Law Institute, who, you know, not only were they fantastic at helping, but the wide variety of fellows who were a part of it really pitched in and made this work in phenomenal ways. The other thing that's been sort of striking in this is that, um, you know, part of it is, is it's hard to figure out how to host an event like this. Um, it, it requires resources and support. And I was honored and delighted that I, I was able to turn to an amazing group of um, sponsors who totally came and pitched in last minute to make this all viable. And I really want to thank our sponsors, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Ford Foundation, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the John S. and uh, James L. Knight Foundation, Microsoft Research, and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. All of them have helped support Data and Society to make this a viable option, to make certain that we could record this, that the material would be available in the public. And indeed, the recordings from tonight will be made um, available off of the Data and Society website um, you know, in the days to come. Uh, Likewise, as I mentioned earlier, all of our previous conversations will be available. I hope that tonight's conversation is just the beginning of a longer, sustained conversation across the city, across this country, to figure out how we want to live in a world with data. There are so many opportunities, there's so many challenges, and we hope all of you will be a part of it. Thank you so very much.